Welcome to the Saddleback College Emeritus Institute Dorothy Marie Lowry Distinguished Guest Lecture Series, recorded in Spring 2020. Thanks also to our faculty moderator, Mrs. Laura Hoffman. For more information regarding the Emeritus Institute, please visit our website at www.saddleback.edu forward slash emeritus. This week, I'm proud to present our lecture for the guest lecture series. I'm happy to introduce you to Mar Martin Smith. He is a veteran journalist and magazine editor who has won more than 50 newspaper and magazine writing awards. And his crime novels have been nominated for three of the publishing industry's most prestigious honors, including the Edgar Award the Anthony Award, and the Barry Award. He is also the author of five nonfiction books, including his latest, Post Op, Untold Stories of Life, Love, and Transformation from the World's Unlikely Sex Change Capital. It'll be published in spring 2021. He's a former senior editor of the LA Times Magazine, or Los Angeles Times Magazine, uh, he was the editor-in-chief of Orange Coast Magazine in Orange County between 2007 and 2016, during which time the Western Publishing Association five times named Orange Coast the best city metropolitan magazine in the Western U.S., including four consecutive wins between 2013 and 2016. As an editor, Martin Smith has worked with a diverse group of writers, including Pulitzer Prize winning journalists and best-selling authors such as Anne Lamotte, Joseph Wambaugh, Walter Mosley, Amy Tan, Martin Dugard, Janet Fitch, Edward Humes, J.R. Moringer, and James Elroy. He is a faculty member of the Squaw Valley Community of Writers and for years has taught an underground workshop course called Writing the Novel at Chapman University. Smith's, Smith's fiction and nonfiction work has drawn critical praise in equal measures. International bestseller James Elroy called Time Release, Smith's 1997 debut novel, a whipcord thriller full of deftly drawn characters, intrigue, and taut action. He also called Smith a thriller force to be reckoned with. New York Times bestseller Michael Connolly described Smith's 2016 suspense thriller, Combustion, a page turner with a kicker at the end. You can't ask for anything better. Intricately plotted and full of character, this one is a great ride that burns with the intensity of a California wildfire. But in 2016, after all of this, Martin Smith surprised his friends and professional colleagues by leaving his longtime home of Southern California to live in rural Granby, Colorado, with a population of 1,800. He's with us today to talk about that unusual big decision, why he made it, and how we can all make equally deliberate choices as we approach the important third act of our lives. I present with pleasure, Martin Smith. Hi, everyone. I want to first want to thank Dan and Laura for inviting me to speak as part of this distinguished lecture series. It's an honor and a privilege, and I'm, I'm grateful for the opportunity. And while I'd hoped to be in Orange County to, to talk to you in person today, uh, the coronavirus sort of changed those plans. So I'm coming to you today, as Laura said, from rural Rocky Mountain town of Granby, Colorado, a place that four years ago I might have considered the middle of nowhere or just one of many backwater outposts far from Orange County and the rest of civilization. But I've been happily self-isolating here since May of 2016 with 1,800 other locals in a county with only 15,000 people. I spend my days immersed in the natural world, 
living exactly the way I imagined living during my first 60 years, working when I want to work on, on a schedule of my choosing. But that's not an accident. And that's what I want to talk about today. How to live the later years of your life as a deliberate choice. So let me introduce you to where I am. Uh, this is a photograph of my backyard, obviously in the fall. Uh, we have a pond just off the back porch, which we enjoy year round. I'm able to, as I said, able to immerse myself in the natural world. This is the Colorado River headwaters that flows about 50 yards from our back door. Um, I enjoy biking, um, skiing. Um, this is my wife uh, skiing last winter. She just learned to ski when we moved up here four years ago um, and has taken to it pretty well. This is my daughter and my daughter-in-law uh, to uh, uh, sort of uh, on, the, on the ranch here where I live, uh, cross-country skiing. And I take advantage of all of those things. And I'm not complaining about my life before all this, not at all. As a magazine editor in Orange County, home to more than 3 million people, I ate in some of the world's finest restaurants. And my role as a magazine editor gave me access to much of that. I sipped cocktails on the decks of amazing hotels. I attended parties and social events with some of the most powerful and interesting people in the world. My life in Orange County was one of privilege and access of professional fulfillment and dizzying social engagement. And I don't regret a minute of it. I had a blast. Today, my friends here in Colorado are ranchers and career forest service employees, small business owners, seasonal lift operators, and wilderness outfitters. I buy my eggs from a family that, like me, left Southern California looking for something different. I drop $5 in the honor jar and take my eggs from the front porch fridge. I drive five miles each way to pick up my mail. Our postmistress, Kate, is another Southern California transplant. She has an ailing mother in South Carolina and fosters senior dachshunds. I know these things because I not only see Kate at the post office, but at the grocery store and once at a going away party for a mutual friend. I spend summer mornings sipping coffee and watching the resident geese on our pond shepherd their goslings back and forth between the shore and an island to keep them safe from the resident fox. I spend it watching local osprey nosedive for trout. Our local eagle pair patrol the nearby Colorado River. I left Orange County in May of 2016 looking for a different way to live and moving to this remote outpost at 8,000 feet above sea level just outside the western entrance to Rocky Mountain National Park was in many ways like moving to another planet after 31 years in Southern California. It's certainly not for everybody. Your vision of your best life may differ and probably does, but it was exactly how I'd imagined living out the final act of my life. Now, fair warning, I usually talk like a guy who's off his medication. So when I told my wife I'd been invited to deliver this distinguished lecture today, she suggested after she stopped laughing that perhaps I should write down some thoughts so I didn't start babbling and dangerously free associating like I, was, like I was leading a White House coronavirus news conference. So I hope you'll bear with me as I work my way through this speech. I've always believed in the importance of perspective and that the best way to understand something, anything, is to consider it from a distance. That's why at age 60, I decided to run away from home and think really hard about life and how I live it. The decision wasn't as impulsive as it sounds. I began making deliberate choices about how I wanted to spend the third act of my life during my 31 year career in Southern California that included writing five novels, four nonfiction books, nine years as a reporter and columnist for the Orange County Register, seven years as a top editor at the LA Times Magazine, and a total of 13 years as the editor of Orange Coast Magazine here in Orange County. But I walked away from the life I worked so hard to achieve in order to pursue the life I'd always imagined, a rural one of profound simplicity and bountiful solitude, a life in which I could be more aware of the rhythms of nature and of the people around me than traffic patterns on the 405 
or how to avoid a ticket on street cleaning day. I didn't retire exactly because I'm still very much working, but I did make a conscious decision to step back. I've been happily self-isolating since 2016 because I had a persistent escape fantasy. Those fantasies are pretty common among us, of those of us of a certain age, but that's hardly new. In the 1940s, writer E.B. White left Manhattan in a 10-year career as a staffer at The New Yorker and lit out for rural Maine. That's where he wrote Charlotte's Web, which was a direct outgrowth of that experience. White's collection of essays from that period, One Man's Meat, remains a memorial, uh, memorial accounting of that fantasy as it played out during a previous generation. White may as well have been speaking for me when during a 1942 interview with the New York Times, he said he moved to the main farm because it was something we'd always wanted to do and we could do. A good many people in New York seem to think that going to live on a farm the year round, especially a farm so far away, is some sort of height of affectation. They seem to think you must be either washed up or very rich to do it, but we just wanted to do it. And so I'm going to talk today about the joys, mostly joys, of my late life transition from editing an affluent lifestyle magazine in Orange County to the slow paced life in the ranching community of Granby, essentially from one end of the Colorado River to the other. I don't know whether you'll be appalled by my story or inspired by it. And your idea of a post-career paradise may be very different from my own. It may be a condo in Kauai or playing golf every day or staying right here and taking your grandkids to the beach. Everyone's escape fantasy is gonna be different. I offer my story as a clarion call for deliberate living to anyone who now finds themselves at a similar crossroads of their career and their fantasy life, wondering if they'll ever get the chance to be the person they always imagined themselves to be. For me, that story really began in 2013. The text message arrived with the urgent Morse code alert of my smartphone at 5 p.m. on August 7, 2013. Please see email. It was the sixth day of my first two-week vacation in nearly 10 years, and I was deep into the kind of drooling, pillow-hugging nap that can only follow intense physical exertion. My wife and I had been hiking every day since arriving to visit my sister, Lisa, in the tiny western slope ranching town of Granby, where she built four acres of paradise along the headwaters of the river. Earlier that day, we'd taken our dog deeper into the Rocky Mountain wilderness than either of us had ever been. We'd driven more than 10 miles down a dirt road, then abandoned the car to hike another two miles, and that was just to get to the trailhead. That trail took us farther uphill and rewarded us with a spectacular hike through old growth forest of the never summer wilderness, which we had all of ourselves. On our way back out, we crested a hill and startled a stately moose cow and her calf, which we could tell from 50 yards away was the size of a decent racehorse, baby or not. The mother was twice as big. Either, we'd been told, was the most dangerous animal we could possibly encounter, far more dangerous than bears, and our breathing resumed only when they turned and trotted along the trail away from us. We followed their tracks until they disappeared into the forest but I felt like we tiptoed the remaining miles back to the car. We got home exhausted. By age 57, naps had become one of the great and decadent luxuries of my life. In recent years, I learned to schedule them into my weekends as one might a dinner or a movie and embrace them as one of the most joyful and restorative parts of my high stress, high stakes life as a magazine editor. I recognize them now as a reaction to the rigors of my daily life which is why I rolled over and ignored my phone's urgent alert and also ignored its equally urgent follow-up alert. I could not, however, ignore my wife. It's from Jim, she said, handing me the phone. Jim Walters, the magazine's unflappable managing editor, was seven inches taller than me and three years older, the Gibraltar of the editorial staff. He knows I'm always available to help resolve situations that arise, but understood that I was generally unavailable during this long-awaited vacation. Besides, things were well under control when I'd left the office at 8.30 p.m. six days before. The editorial and sales staffs were wrapping up deadline for the September issue, 
featuring our annual fall fashion preview and preparing to send it out to the printer. What own unfolding crisis could possibly have Jim calling me, urging me to check my email at this late stage? You know, life can deliver its defining moments in the most interesting ways. For me, it came via Jim's email laying out the situation. The magazine's new publisher was concerned that the cover headline touting our fashion feature about absurdly voluminous women's fall fashions. Fall fashion, size matters in the season's hottest looks, made it sound like a feature about well-dressed fat women in Orange County, the world capital of buff, buff fitness, breast implants, and other cosmetic surgeries. Given that many of those businesses made up the bulk of the magazine's advertising base, the publisher suggested we consider changing the cover line to something a little more elegant. And look, I try to be helpful. The company that owned the magazine at the time was that rarest of things, a commercial magazine publisher dedicated to the highest levels of journalistic quality and professional integrity. It showed in all six of the city regional titles it published, and I was proud to be part of such a company. But since the economic earthquake of 2008, my magazine's revenues had skidded to a perilous level. Our many competitors didn't play this by the same high-minded standards, and they were gaining ground. By late summer of 2013, a fragile economic recovery was underway, and the return of fashion, fashion advertising was going to be an important factor in the magazine's revival. This new publisher arrived a few months before with a clear mandate to turn the revenue situation around. I was doing my best to support him in that mission because I like having a job, but I was trying to do so without compromising the integrity we'd worked so hard to build. And I know any concession might be seen by the editorial staff as a step in the wrong direction. Worse, as I reconsidered the cover line I'd written, I realized that the new publisher was right. The line was ambiguous and needed to be clarified. On the other hand, there was a logistical problem. We'd hired a, hired a high priced artist to create the cover. We'd gone through at least a half dozen rounds of design and text tweaks, including corporate level approval and still settled on my flawed wording. It happens. Our design director had assured the lettering artist our wording was absolutely final before giving him the green light to start work. And we knew changing it later would mean going back to the artist and hoping he had time to re rework the design. It also was gonna cost us more money from our always tight editorial budget. And of course, the deadline to get the issue to our printer was bearing down. Whatever I decided to do was going to make someone angry, either the new publisher or the design director or the rest of the editorial staff, which might see it as a spineless compromise of our independence. Eventually, I ended up making the change. This is the final September cover of 2013, and you can read the line. It became fall fashion, full volume is the season's big look. But on that particular day, I sat up in bed and I kicked off the comforter. My heart was beating faster than it had at any time that day, even while walking uphill at high altitude, even after startling a mother moose on a remote trail miles from help. In the bathroom mirror, I recognized a familiar stress returning to my shoulders, which normally creep up around my neck in trying times. If you think of a, a turtle um, retracting its head into its protective shell, that's me. After nearly a week in the Rockies, the deep furrows in my forehead had begun to ease, making me look less like a Civil War veteran than I normally do. My hair was still snow white, as it had been for years, but now the furrows were back as prominent as the ridges and canyons through which we'd hiked that morning. The sudden reversal was startling. Stress kills, I know that, and I've built into my life the release valves my body needs to manage it. I exercise often, hiking, mountain biking, ski biking, skiing, playing soccer. But there I stood before the mirror, staring into the Dorian Gray face of stress incarnate. In an instant, I'd lost the ground I'd gained during my first six days of vacation, all because a few words I'd written on the magazine's September cover might make readers think we'd made an ine inelegant decision to spotlight fashion for Orange County's fatties. 
This was a crisis that undid six days of relaxation. That's what was making me incredibly tense. Really? And there it was. I felt the tremor like a tectonic strike slip that left me disoriented and unbalanced. A defining moment then convinced me that something had to change. My next thought was even scarier. I was the one that was going to have to change it. We're all writing our own story, and we all want to be the hero of that story. And because I'm a writer, I know that most effective stories usually unfold in three acts. You know this already. It's already, it's a reality etched into your subconscious because it's like the, the structure of every novel you've ever read or film you've ever watched. In the first act, we meet the hero and begin to understand the forces that shaped him or her. In my case, I was raised in Western Pennsylvania, educated at Penn State, and spent the early years of my professional life as a reporter for Pennsylvania newspapers. At the end of the first act, our hero typically faces some sort of crisis or reaches a crossroads where he or she must make a choice. In my case, I was living my dream life. I had the job I wanted. I'd married the woman I loved. Life was good. But my crisis was self-inflicted. I was 29 and I was grappling with an existential question. Is this all there is? So just keep doing what I'm doing for another 40 years? When you're 29, that sounds like a prison sentence. So I decided to make the second act very different, radically different. When I write and when I teach, I often preach the simple wisdom of the basic three act structure. In the first act, the writer must assemble his or her characters on stage and set them off on a course that promises some drama down the road. Ideally, the first act ends with a dilemma or a choice that will complicate the life of the protagonist. The second act, I call it the murky middle, is when those complications reach a critical mass. Our hero is sailing through increasingly difficult waters, facing setbacks, reversals, obstacles, and the vital dramas of life that raise the action to a pitch that seems unsustainable. But the third and final act, that's the toughie in both fiction and in real life. We so want it to please us. But we've all read stories by writers who introduce us to characters we find compelling, skillfully coax us through the end of the second act, and then let us down in act three. The hero's ultimate choices seem illogical or deeply flawed, or the author relies on some lame contrivance to make sense of the story. As a result, the resolution doesn't satisfy, and one looks back on the experience as inconclusive or at best, at best, or at worst, a regrettable waste of time. Looking back, I can see how deeply I've infused the three-act structure into the story of my life. Judy and I spent our first act, roughly 30 years, in Pennsylvania, me in Pittsburgh, she in Easton, just north of Philadelphia, on the opposite side of the state. We met in the state's middle while we were both students at Penn State and began our relationship in Easton during a post-college interlude when I was working as a reporter for her hometown newspaper, and she was slinging pizzas at a joint near Lafayette College and waiting to hear back from grad schools. She ended up at the University of Pittsburgh, and six months later, coincidentally, I ended up at the Pittsburgh Press. The universe was telling us something, we decided, and we got married in 1982. By 1985, I'd been, I'd been working the best job I could imagine in Pittsburgh as a staff writer for the newspaper's Sunday Magazine. But I also felt like I'd somehow peaked at 29. It was an odd feeling. Happy as I was, I was distressed by the idea that the future promised a few more decades of doing pretty much the same thing in the same place. I felt the need for a change. At that point, I'd been a journalist for seven years during a period of bone rattling economic and social change. The American steel industry was melting down. Like a lot of people in Western Pennsylvania, my father, who worked for US Steel for 42 years, was sucked into the downward spiral. Its effects on me weren't just personal, but professional. As a newspaper reporter, I wrote a lot of stories about that decline and the social fallout from it, including the financial devastation, home, phone, home floor closures, domestic and workplace violence, all of it. 
Then I got an offer to work for a paper in Southern California, the Orange County Register. And it became, I became part of Pittsburgh's great diaspora. The city's population had shrunk by half during those grim years, even as its economic and cultural renaissance began to pick up steam. My decision to leave was not entirely driven by the economic slide, but rather by a searching curiosity about life beyond Western Pennsylvania. At the time, the Orange County Register was running stories with a decidedly different flavor than those I was accustomed to writing. Many of them were about growth and affluence and people taking bold risks. The housing market was booming, the population was growing. Two well-financed local papers, the Register and the LA Times, were fighting a turf war for educated and affluent readers. Kids were driving Ferraris to their senior proms. The papers were publishing stories about whales, whales, on the front page. In short, Southern California was the opposite of where I grew up, and I was drawn, like so many other refugees, to this warm and sunny place. I jumped and realize now that was the start of my life's second act. The job I accepted in 1985 at the Register was where I found myself writing about very different things, everything from kosher tacos to whale migration to unrestrained growth. Turns out despair wasn't all there was. That's not to say my wife was 100% behind the idea. She wasn't and decided to let me go on my own for a year, I think secretly hoping that this strange notion of mine might pass. After a year, Judy, a city manager, agreed to join me in Southern California, but that meant she had to restart her career and begin rebuilding her professional reputation from the ground up, just as I had done. She went to work initially for the city of Beverly Hills. We bought a house, not our first, but certainly the most expensive. Daughter Laney arrived in 1988, son Parker in 1992. For both of us, starting a family meant dropping anchor in life's endless sea of possibilities. One does not lightly walk away from a stable home, good schools, and the endless commitments of dance classes, soccer and little league, or the awesome obligations and responsibilities as Cubmaster of Pac-276 of the Cub Scouts of America. I fondly remember our second act as a blast. Now, since this is a uh, distinguished lecture, I decided it needed some official looking charts and graphs. So here's one I came up with. Things I love about city life, um, things that you don't get way out here in the country. Uh, for example, when you fly in or fly out of, of the airport, uh, you can depend on friends to pick you up or drop you off. Can't do that when you live two hours from the airport, as I do now. Uh, access to Costco, that's a big one. Um, the nearest Costco to us is a two hour drive. It's a beautiful drive, but it's a two hour drive each way. Uh, and then you'll see an Asian food theme coming in here. Uh, pho, the wonderful Vietnamese noodle soup that I grew to love during my years in Southern California. Nowhere in Grand County can you get pho. And of course, Thai takeout, which um, was my sustenance for 31 years. Uh, there is none of that either in Grand County, Colorado. But in truth, our time in Southern California passed in a 31 year blur that included all of the setbacks, reversals, obstacles, and vital dramas of sustaining both a marriage and parallel careers without doing too much damage to the two remarkable humans in our care. After the kids left for college, we confronted a dilemma familiar to many empty nesters, I'm sure many in this room. Assuming we'd, we'd both get a third act, and Judy's mother and both of my parents lived well past 90, how should we script it? All of us get one shot at this, and we wanted our finale to be the result of smart and deliberate choices, not inertia and routine. We wanted our ending to satisfy, but how? After a few years as empty nesters, Judy decided to retire after a long high stress run in city government. With her master's in public administration, she'd artfully navigated a career that included a series of jobs as city finance director, assistant city manager, and eventually city manager. Her professional reputation was not just unblemished, but beyond reproach. Her decision to leave her job at age 57 startled her city's elected council members and professional staff, who staged a string of public and heartwelt heartfelt farewells. 
But Judy's an introvert by nature and dealing with posturing politicians, local citizens, and sometimes difficult employees had taken a toll. Plus, she's always had a fatalistic view of life, perhaps the result of losing her father when she, he was only 48 and she was just 17. She always seems to carry the weight of knowing that tomorrow isn't guaranteed. Me, as the indulged youngest child of four children whose life has been remarkably untarnished by personal tragedy, I tend to be confident and happy no matter where I am or what I'm doing. I was still enjoying my career as a magazine editor and pleased that major publishers still showed interest in the novels and nonfiction books that I wrote on the side. I was willing to ignore the occasional aggravations of daily life in Southern California, and I was still having fun, mostly. Here's another slide I thought make, might make this lecture look a little more distinguished. Uh, things I don't love about city life. First one is pretty self-explanatory. Um, the second one involves whether you have to have your dog on a leash when you walk him or not, or whether you have to pick up after your dog or not. Um, the third is self-explanatory, death stress. I talked about that. The, the fourth is just a matter of density. Um, in Southern California, we tended to live so close to our neighbors that we could hear them on the toilet or in the bedroom, and that sort of wore on me. Um, but the thought of chucking it all and starting over somewhere else had undeniable appeal, an appeal magnified by each workplace crisis or traffic jam. I remember one Mother's Day when we decided to drive from our home in Laguna Niguel to downtown LA to have brunch and spend the day with our daughter. Just getting there took us three hours. That's about the time we decided to walk away from the life we worked so hard to achieve and to script this unusual third act. We decided to pursue the life we'd always imagined, life for the first time on what I considered a human scale. Now, we'd been coming to Granby, Colorado to visit my older sister, Lisa, since 1998, when she finished building an idyllic yellow house on four acres, just a few miles from the Colorado River. Headwaters, so the headwaters of the Colorado River. That river begins as the outflow of a small lake in Rocky Mountain National Park then drops into a ravine stretching west from the Continental Divide. It tumbles down into a series of lakes and reservoirs, Grand Lake, Shadow Mountain Lake, and Lake Granby, and then emerges from Granby Dam into what for the first time looks like an actual river. It's about as wide as a two-lane road when it flows past the house a mile downstream from the dam, defining the edge of Lisa's property. The mighty Colorado River may be the awe-inspiring sculptor of the Grand Canyon and the quencher of thirst and waterer of lawns for the many millions of people in its path, including Orange County. But at the spot where it passes about 100 yards from the house, it's easy to wade across and seldom more than knee deep. This is our house here in the lower right. Um, that's the pond just outside our back door. And you can see where the river flows in relation to the house. 13 years older than me, Lisa had moved to Granby looking essentially for the opposite of Phoenix, the Arizona desert city she detested despite having raised five kids there. She had a few considerations in mind. She wanted to be near a county road. She also wanted the place to, she moved to have at least some competent medical facility. And finally, she wanted to be no more than two hours from a major airport. She found Granby about 90 minutes from downtown Denver and two hours from its airport. She understood that life would be different here, and we also began to realize that after we started making visits. The police blotter in the local newspaper reads a bit differently. Here are a couple of examples. Um, this is one of my favorite. Here's another one, sorry it's blurry. A cow was caught in baling twine on US Highway 40 near Granby. The local museum exhibits include one about barbed wire. Our nearby ranch store includes some interesting barbecue lighters. These are the AR-15 model barbecue lighter. It's not the homeless we find rooting through our dumpsters, but bears. And when bears get hungry, they head through the dumpster and through the top of the dumpster. 
Our local bike shop repair, bike repair shop, also sells bison meat. I often joke that people in Grand County usually have two jobs and play in a band. So everybody does multiple things up here. The volunteers up here, also opportunities up here also include pie judging contests. The circumstances that complicate daily life sometimes include a pregnant moose cow who decides to bed down in your pasture, making passage between the house and the river rather tricky. And renegade cows. You really haven't lived until you photographed your wife chasing an escaped cow out of the yard in her pajamas. Not long after my sister finished building her house, though, my, her long marriage began to unravel. The split was amiable, her ex kept their place in Phoenix, and she settled into an often solitary mountain life. But the divorce also put her in a tricky financial situation. There aren't many ways to make a living in Grand County, at least not enough to, of a living to support the special place that had become her full-time home and life's work. She created a retreat, her retreat to be a focal point for her scattered family a calm center of the universe for her five kids and their kids. The perfect grandma house, she used to call it. Facing the prospect of losing that home before realizing her dream, she invited my wife and I to invest in the place. We didn't think long. At the time, we were living in a loner home offered to us as part of my wife's compensation package, an arrangement that eventually would stretch to 15 years. We had no mortgage and therefore no, no mortgage write-off at tax time. We also had sold our home and had been out of the Southern California real estate market for many years. It's very hard to get back in. We needed a way to accumulate equity at a time when my adored older sister needed an investor. It was a no brainer. That was in 2002. At first it was just that, an investment, but it soon became something more. And when Lisa died in 2015, we found ourselves living in Southern California but with a house in Colorado. Within months and after intense consult consultations with a financial planner, we made our decision. It was time to take a risk. We were both 59 and ready for act three. Now, after more than three decades of raising kids and chasing careers across Southern California, we were drawn like my sister to Grand County's mostly ranches and unexploited wilderness. Historian Robert Black called the county an island in the Rockies and even in Granby, its largest city with 1,800 residents, that remains true today. Manifest Destiny carried many westbound pioneers to the base of the mountains that rise just west of Denver. But because of the mountains, they tended to move around Grand, Grand County like a stream flowing past a mass of rock. As a result, this part of Colorado's Middle Park is a relatively unspoiled. As I mentioned, we sometimes buy fresh eggs from the nearby ranchers sometimes still warm, occasionally with a green goose egg thrown in. And know that Kate, the postmistress, can fetch our mail without ever asking for our pox number. For Easter dinner two weeks ago, we had the most delicious lamb I've ever tasted. And the rancher who raised it, she was there too. This is life on a human scale, not the white knuckled thrill ride to which I'd grown accustomed. The idea was really seductive. Our kids were still young when we first began spending vacations in the mountains. During our years as Colorado visitors, Laney learned to fly fish and Parker to snowboard at a nearby resort. Both learned to drive on the ranch's dusty roads. During the decade that followed that we owned the share of the place, my, my family anticipated our visits no less than we used to anticipate Christmas morning. During the two-day drive from Southern California, our complicated lives receded into the congestion in our rearview mirror. Each time we visited, I looked forward to the moment when we pulled into the Granby House driveway, a moment when invariably the last of the tension melted from my shoulders. Part of the reason I'm convinced is the history of the property itself. The house sits on four acres of what once was the YMCA of Denver's 500 acre summer camp, Camp Chief Ure. It's now a small trout fishing community of about 25 homes. To this day, we get people drifting slowly past our driveway with a familiar look on their faces. Sometimes they stop. Once in a while, especially in the warmer months when we're outside, the driver backs up, pulls in and steps out. 
Typically, he or she is older and with a wistful look of a searcher. Did this used to be, they always begin? Yes, I nod. Camp Chief Ure. What happens next is predictable and remarkably consistent. They look around, taking in the place as it is now, remembering how it was then, whenever then was. In the pause that follows, they look as though they're reassembling something precious from scraps of memory, piecing together a part of themselves they thought they'd misplaced or maybe lost altogether a long time ago. Would you like to look around, I always ask. Some do, most don't. My affirmation of their memory is usually enough. Thank you, they'll say, and then climb back into their car and drive away. A hike around the property today takes you past remnants of what once was. The wooded chapel with its small stone pulpit and the wooden pews that have fallen into disrepair, the spaces between them spiked by aspen saplings. The totem pole, site of countless bonfires and no doubt solemn camp ceremonies. The ancient stable and the wood canopy of the rifle range, where to this day, the safety instructions remain stenciled on the wall. To me, it feels like every trail and tree in this place is infused with the joy of city people discovering the wider, wilder world. A couple of years ago, I tagged along on a tour that the YMCA organized for the people who'd spent time at Camp Chief Ure. As the tour ended, the group milled around the barnyard before boarding their buses taking pictures of each other in front of the barn, telling stories of summer loves and influential counselors and moments spent in that magic twilight between adolescence and adulthood. They seemed in no hurry to leave, enjoying the personal and mystical power of the hallowed ground upon which they stood. It was as though the laughter and friendships and wide-eyed wonder of their early wilderness experiences somehow seeped into the dirt and grew up into the cottonwoods and aspens scenting the aromatic sage and the reedy dampness around the pond and the ripening late summer hay. Looking into their faces, I'm reminded that we're all just passing through these special places, squatters in paradise, and that this land I'm privileged to call home does not really belong to me. For more than a decade after we first bought in, Lisa, living alone, continued to perfect the place and to be its gracious host and relentless caretaker. With the money we paid her for the privilege of ownership, she was able to travel the world and spend holidays and special occasions with her scattered family. Sometimes when she was away, Judy and I would drive up from Southern California to have the house to ourselves. And during those peaceful visits, we began tacking our lives toward the promise that someday, if the stars aligned, we might even retire there, despite common wisdom about the risk of relocating in retirement and friends warning us about the trauma of late life upheaval. The logistics seemed workable. My sister, an unapologetic smoker, knew she eventually would reach a stage when she no longer would be able to tolerate the 8,000 foot altitude or the climate at that point. And at one point, that climate dropped snow flurries on the local 4th of July parade. She'd built a wonderful life in Granby, spending the long sunny winters reading and thinking and reserving the warmer months for a near constant flow of visitors. Her routine included bright mornings of breakfast, coffee, and idle conversation on the back porch overlooking the pond, and long evenings with friends over casual meals. For years, I considered Lisa the one person in my life who had it all figured out, and I wanted that. In October 2014, Judy and I finalized the deal that gave us full ownership of the house. The sale agreement included a provision that Lisa could live there and continue perfecting it for another five years. By then, we all agreed Lisa would be ready to move and Judy and I would be ready to retire. Then life happened. The following spring, my adored older sister was diagnosed with a rare advanced stage cancer, a cancer common among heavy smokers. The prognosis was grim. Chemo? She tried it for a month. But when tests showed that the chemicals and the cancer fought to a draw, she didn't hesitate to call off the effort to prolong her life. Like several strong women I've had the privilege of knowing, she committed to the goal of dying as efficiently as possible. She spent her last summer graciously receiving the many kids, grandkids, cousins, nieces, nephews, and friends who often traveled thousands of miles to say goodbye. 
It was the most sustained and spellbinding act of courage I've ever seen by someone who spent her life showing the rest of us how to live graciously, thoughtfully, and with a wicked good sense of humor. Why shouldn't she show us how to die that way too? She finally began to falter in late August 2015. A few weeks later, she was gone, leaving behind a large and grateful family and the special place she'd created. This is all of my sister's kids and grandkids and my wife Judy and myself on the front porch uh, the morning that we held a memorial for her. During the winter that followed, the house, always so full of life and people, sat empty. When Judy and I visited six months after she died, we discovered that mice had moved in to escape from the cold. They'd made nests beneath the sofa cushion and stocked them with caches of kibble they'd stolen from our dog's bowl on previous visits. The place had an empty, eerie feeling, and it felt all wrong. Judy and I had been together more than 40 years at that point, 34 of them in a marriage that has grown stronger with the passage of time. We're as different as two individuals can be. I'm an extrovert who embraces change and adventure as passionately as my introverted wife embraces routine and stability. But our mutual appreciation of those differences has made for a long and happy ride. And on the big questions, we always seem tuned to the same frequency. With Lisa's passing, we both sensed, again, that the universe was trying to tell us something. I'm not a religious person. But yes, I believe the universe sends clear and unmistakable signals to each of us. And over time, I've learned to listen to those signals. The signal this time was loud and clear. We lived in Orange County, but the house we loved and the life we always wanted was in Colorado. I wasn't even 60 yet and hardly ready to retire. But we decided to make the leap of faith. That first involved recognizing a couple of important things about life in general. These days, it's pretty easy to stay connected in this era of social media. For family and friends, Facebook and FaceTime can keep you involved in everyone's day-to-day -day life, sometimes more than is healthy. And if you still have a professional life, there's always the phone and Skype and Zoom. Your physical location these days is far less important than it once was. So why not be where you want to be? We had a uh, virtual cocktail party with some friends of ours a few weeks ago. Number two, you really don't need a lot of stuff. Not to get too zen on you here, but in the end, the stuff we collect throughout our lives is just stuff our kids are gonna have to toss. They really don't care about my collection of tickets from my favorite concerts, my high school yearbooks, or that fine linen tablecloth embroidered by a great aunt they never met. My Marie Kondo style advice, sell or give away everything you don't use or need. Reduce your belongings to the things you need or cherish. If you have a sentimental attachment to something but don't ever use it, take a picture of it. Things are just things. Our Colorado house was already furnished, so we were able to be ruthless in our decluttering. By the time we left Southern California, everything we owned fit into a small U-Haul truck, and it wasn't even full. My models, of course, were my sister and E.B. White. I admired White both as a writer and as a person, and I began to wonder if it was still possible to make the same kind of radical move that he did, even if at a later phase in life. Was it possible to update the escape fantasy from my generation and give it a distinctly Western flavor by chronicling my late life transition from fast paced Orange County to a slow paced life in the ranching community here? And how would it affect my life as a writer? Now, just as White distilled his experience of moving from the city to the country into Charlotte's web, using barnyard animals as proxies, proxies for his own experiences, I too began chronicling our transitions the, through the adventures of our late dog, Scotty. I started doing it in emails to friends, then in Facebook posts, and ultimately in magazine articles. I'm considering gathering it all into a children's book about a city dog becoming a country dog. Why? To be honest, Scotty's a lot more interesting than we are. And seeing this strange new world through his eyes seemed to be the most interesting and refreshing way to communicate what it was like. Plus, writing about him seemed to be a good way to get around the warning from E.B. White's dyspeptic friend. 
So let me tell you about Scotty. He was a rat terrier, 18 pounds of fast twitch muscle and sinew shaped like a miniature greyhound, colored like a Holstein cow, and possessed of an obvious short man's complex, much like me. His physical skills were formidable. He had a cobra's reflexes, and at top speed, he seemed to have been shot from a cannon, a talent that went undiscovered during countless leashed urban walks. It emerged after we began staging illegal off-leash fetch sessions at a city park, seldom patrolled by animal control. When he was with other dogs, he'd run circles around the pack, like a wrestling referee goading the others to chase him. He'd pace the takers for a few laps around the park, just for fun. If one of the speedier dogs got too close, Scotty just shifted into the gear that the chase dog would never have and sprinted away. Still, he'd always been a city dog with, dog with doggy quirks and phobias. He refused to swim or even wade into water deeper than where his testicles used to be. This is Scotty in my office at Orange Coast uh, before we moved. This is Scotty's first few steps into a new life. Thunder would set him quaking and 4th of July fireworks were his kryptonite. His most obvious tell, his bobbed tail. You can see it there in the picture. It was usually thrust up like a rear end rhino horn. And when he was excited, it ticked side to side like a metronome. But when he was scared, he crumped it, clamped it tight over his otherwise proud and prominent butt. In the city, in times of stress, he'd slink off to the laundry room. We'd sometimes run the dryer for him to dry out the noise. Still, he'd otherwise mastered urban life, as had we. Despite its stresses, we were all one percenters, well-fed, well-housed, and masters of our domain. And Scotty was the constant focus of our affection in our quiet, empty nest, until we turned it all upside down. If you'll indulge me, I'd like to read a short piece I wrote about him in the most recent issue of Adventure Journal. Now, this is a wonderful magazine. It's based right here in Orange County, um, uh, edited by Steve Casimiro. If you don't subscribe, do yourself a favor. It's really an extraordinary magazine. As it turned out, this piece was Scotty's epitaph, going to print the same day he died. But it stands as both a testament to a fine, fine dog as well as a metaphor for our third act lives. Scotty, our inscrutable rat terrier, is the end product of thousands of years of canine domestication. It left him with an aversion to popping campfires, a naivete about coyotes, and a willingness to subsist on the dry kibble we offer him twice daily with a probiotic thrown in to aid digestion. For his first seven years, our city dog was basically an anxious parasite but one we grew to love. That's not to say he had no admirable qualities. Bred for anti-rodent work, he always considered himself an apex predator, though oblivious to the wild beyond. As a result, he had the misguided self-confidence of a trust funder on safari. But in 2016, my wife and I decided to leave the balmy life of Southern Californians to stage our third act in the rural Rocky Mountains in a town where the winter temperatures hold for days below zero and the welcome sign reads, adventure awaits. Eager to simplify and live on a more human scale, we transplanted ourselves on the equivalent of a distant planet. The challenge to evolve, adapt, and become more attuned to the natural world. Of course, the natural world can be a dangerous place for a city dog, and we worried how Scotty would fare. Our new turf is regularly crossed by megafauna, including moose, foxes, bears, one obese porcupine, and lately a mountain lion. Our hikes often take us past the remains of deer, pronghorn, and other slow-footed victims of fleet-footed car carnivores. Here's another chart. This is my megafauna index. Was there a spot in that uncivilized place where an unleashed rat terrier might discover his primal self? Or, or was he more likely to end up as a meal? Here's a little catalog of wildlife experiences we've had here. Um, this is looking out our kitchen window about a year ago. This is our yearling moose. Uh, his mother had booted him out of the nest and he was now wandering alone, a very sad sight. 
Uh, I woke up one morning this winter uh, to my wife's sharp elbow in my ribs. Um, and she said, look out the window, out the bedroom window. And there were a uh, herd of elk. There were nine this time. We've had as many as 25 uh, standing around on the frozen ice of the pond. Just to be able to gauge the depth of the snow we're talking about here, in the foreground here, you can barely see the tops of two patio chairs. So the snow at that point was at least three feet deep. Well, we get out for hiking every day and occasionally we run across a track that we just really don't understand. I attribute that to the fact that we're city people, but this one was particularly baffling, as was this one. Our first mornings in the country, Scotty Church charged onto the porch like a barnyard rooster. He thrust his nose into the air to survey his new territory. Nothing smelled familiar, but everything smelled interesting. Within weeks, our little alpha had established a perimeter he was prepared to defend and set about making that acre his own. He began by cataloging the, hi cataloging the hidey holes and favored trees of various squirrels, chipmunks, and voles, and spent each day running an endless inspection circuit. His vigilance suggested rodent nation was somehow massing along the property line for an attack. His swagger said, I've got this. But self-confidence can get you in trouble. Scotty's first lesson in humility came one twilight when we opened the door to let him out for the day's final pee. He charged a moving shape in the yard and came away with about 25 porcupine quills embedded in his snout. This is the obese porcupine. This is Scotty undergoing surgery in the bathroom. We ended up taking him eventually to our vet uh, to get the rest of them out. Uh, porcupine quills are, are scaled like fish scales and we, they go in easily, but they don't come out easily. So we ended up having to take him to the vet. Uh, this was him after the anesthesia. And that local vet maintains a wall of shame featuring pictures of spike-faced dogs who'd made the same mistake. Judging by the photos, Scotty got off pretty easy. Undeterred, he continued his patrols. Finally, after a few months, and this is Scotty, ever vigilant, uh, by air, by sea, by land, he's, uh, he's taking care of business. Finally, a few months after our arrival, he notched a kill. He was running his usual circuit when my wife flushed something from its hiding spot beneath a pine tree. Scotty moved on instinct, a rodent-seeking missile, a commotion, the sound of a vigorous head shake, and then my wife sensed something soar over her head. It landed with a moist thump. What she found upon closer inspection was a dead vole, or rather half of one. The other half was about 10 feet away. Scotty stood by, no less curious about us than what had just happened. Other homicides followed. One required my wife to crush a suffering chipmunk with a rock. Scotty's reaction is always the same. He stands by looking a little miffed at what he's wrought, curiously sniffing his victim without apparent remorse. It seems weirdly respectful. Then he's back to work. Despite our best efforts, and this is, by the way, Scotty's bone collection, uh, over the last four years, we began to believe he was trying to reassemble an elk um, based on the bones he was bringing home. Despite our best efforts, and, and by the way, this picture here on the left, that's Scotty with a, um, a uh, full-on pronghorn foreleg in his, um, in his jaws, and you can see how joyful he is. Now, despite our best efforts to keep him domesticated, <clears throat> we've seen other signs that Scotty's primal self has emerged. He no longer freaks at the night sounds of coyotes and foxes. He won't hesitate to charge a moose, but he's learned to back off once the bull lowers its head and takes aim. He's suppressed his fear of the pond enough to reach the protruding rocks where our resident geef, geese leave fresh poop, which for some reason he finds delectable. While taking his morning dump, he often walks boldly among the ranch cows that summer in the nearby pasture. Should they venture too, venture too close, the little intruder snarls them back, and then, with contempt, pees on their salt lick. Recently, when two escapees strayed into our driveway, our fledgling little ranch dog dutifully chased them back to the herd. St 
Still, it's sometimes hard to see him as more than a poser. The ranch manager, Pete Dines, has two working retrievers, including an alpha male, Golden, named Henry, and a matronly chocolate lab named Bay. They're on the job at sunup, loping alongside Pete's truck as he patrols our 500-acre development, wading in the river while their human clears beaver dams or runs down poachers. Scotty watches them from our porch like the kid no one picked for their team. It's difficult to read him in those moments. Curious, sure. Envious, I'm projecting. But Scotty's finding subtle ways to prove himself to the locals. Henry's five times Scotty's size, but our defiant little punk often stalks him to steal a stick or a bone or a favorite stuffed animal when the big dog turns his back. We sometimes find these hostages on our porch where they remain until Hen Henry comes to retrieve them. It's worth noting that he usually does so when Scotty's inside and unable to defend. And then we often catch the bigger dog peering through the low windows of the house during these rescue missions, making sure it's safe. Four years on, Scotty's 11-year-old reflexes aren't what they were, a cause for celebration in rodent nation. But in a place where adventure always awaits, maybe his batting average doesn't matter. Not only has our city dog managed to stay off the menu, but he seems to have discovered something elemental about himself, something raw and vital and energizing. We're thriving here in unfamiliar territory, and so is he. To sum up, our third act presents us all with a rare opportunity to live the lives we imagined when we were 17. We can indulge in the things we always loved without restraint. Of course, there are a few tricky things to navigate. First is the question of identity. Who am I now? You don't have a career to define you anymore. You have to define yourself. That's a challenge. Second is activity. Are you prepared to create a whole new structure for your life when your career no longer serves that purpose? And finally, there's the issue of relationships. Are you prepared to spend 24 seven with your spouse or your partner? It, it really is a thing. Again, I like this dog as metaphor video that circulated widely during the recent self-isolation festival that someone called Couples in Quarantine. My advice, figure those things out and just do it. Why? Because it's your chance to live act three exactly as you want to live. For me, it was about finding human connection in an increasingly complicated and polarized world. Even though I'm still working, I've scheduled into my days time to connect with my community. I unload the truck each month at our local food bank. I work two days a week for Habitat for Humanity and serve on the Habitat local board. One unexpected consequence of leaving my career behind is that four years later, my career is now better than ever. I write for local and national magazines, but I only write stories I really care about. I've had two new books published since leaving for Colorado in 2016, and another coming out in the spring of 2021. That one, a, tiny, a nonfiction book about the tiny Colorado mining town of Trinidad, which between 1969 and 2010 became known as the sex change capital of the world. That's a story I might have overlooked completely had I not had the time to discover it. In general, I now can take the time to do things I never would have imagined doing when I lived a fast life in the big city. Here's another example. It's a short story I wrote just last week when a Denver magazine asked me for an essay about how I was dealing with the fallout from the coronavirus outbreak. I think it gets at the thing I love most about the choice that I made, to find a way to live the rest of my life on a human scale. It's called Holy Communion. On the day the president finally realized you can't gaslight a virus and the Dow dropped nearly 3000 points. I got a call from Mark Omasek, a friend in Denver. 
Mark has been through some pretty grim days during his long career as a journalist, including his work helping cover the Columbine shootings for the Denver Post. He won a Pulitzer Prize for that. Mark's a dedicated birder. We've been friends since 2012 when I read The Big Year, his terrific book about the American Birding Association's annual species spotting competition. And I also published a book of my own called The Wild Duck Chase about the strange and wonderful world of competitive duck painting. It's a long story. Anyway, my affable pal has a house in Tabernash, not far from where I live in Granby, and he'd retreated to the mountains with his family to self-isolate. He didn't mention the ongoing end times problems, but instead offered a proposition. Want to go out tonight and seduce some owls? I laughed. It felt wrong, off key, but in all the right ways. So I assessed the situation. Our House of Cards health system was about to be gusted by a global pandemic. The world economy was in China syndrome meltdown, and my retirement account was vaporizing. We still had the same president. What time, I said. Later that night, we set out just a couple of refugees from a foundering world. We met at 8.30 at a Windy Gap Reservoir in Rand County in what seemed like the only cars on the road. The parking lot was closed and gated, so we pulled into a nearby turnout. I'll drive from here, I offered. Mark shook his head. Separate cars. Right. The virus. Okay, I said. You lead, I'll follow. Our destination was the 9,700-foot summit of Willow Creek Pass, which crosses the Continental Divide between Grand and Jackson counties, about 20 rising miles from the Route 40 turnoff. Route 20, 125 was mostly deserted, the night black as coal. Even with the brights on, our headlights showed nothing but road and trees and the occasional flash of spring runoff as it tumbled down the creek. Every few miles, Mark would pull over at what he considered a likely owl habitat, strap on his headlamp, and climb out of, into the evening chill. At our first stop, he set a small speaker on the hood of his truck and fiddled with his smartphone. He turned off his headlamp and tapped the screen. The speaker came alive with the amplified call of a boreal owl. That's what we were after, he explained, a rare, hard-to-spot critter about the size of a beer can. He'd heard from an excited CU Boulder student the night before who'd done exactly what we were doing somewhere over on Cameron Pass. The student claimed he actually got swooped by a horny owl, its wing nearly touching his speaker. There was unmistakable excitement in Mark's voice as he recounted the story. Birders are like that. And it was a refreshing shift in tone after days of sobering infection predictions and televised gloom. I watched him fiddle for a bit. Is that some special speaker system for birding? He shook his head. Nah, you can play public enemy through it if you want. He sounded the avian version of you up a few times while we listened for a response. Silence. So we packed up and drove a few miles more to a small bridge across Willow Creek that led back into the woods. We drove about 100 yards and stopped near a camping turnout where a big pickup truck and a fifth wheel trailer were parked in a small pool of light. We opened our doors into a barrage of raging death metal music. Mark shook his head again. This won't work. After one other stop without luck, we reached the past summit about 9.30. Mark set up again. At one point, he heard something other than an owl, apparently responding to the call. But then again, just silence. We could have declared the evening a failure and packed up to leave. Instead, we stood for a few more minutes, shuffling our feet, trying to stay warm in the cold night air. We both looked up. The sky was clear and freckled with stars. The Milky Way arced above us in a wash of white and we talked beneath that glorious canopy about many things. The retreat of boreal owls to these sky islands, such as the one where we stood. The faint smudge of the Pleiades star cluster. The death of my father two weeks before. I hadn't really talked much about it with anyone outside my family until in that strange circumstance, during this strange time, Mark's condolences triggered a thought. Dad was born in 1918, the year of the Spanish flu. Pneumonia took him from the nursing home he shared with my 98-year-old mother, just a week shy 
of his 102nd birthday. That was shortly before the World Health Organization officially declared COVID-19 a global pandemic, before we all began tossing around terms like self-isolation and N95. Suddenly, I wondered if he'd succumbed to one of the pandemics that bookended his life. And I suppose I'm gonna carry that question forever. Eventually, our conversation stopped. We listened in silence, still hoping. But eventually, Mark and I bumped elbows and said goodbye and followed one another down that same dark road back to the uncertain world we'd left behind. I've been thinking ever since about those owls, waiting alone in the cold and dark, hoping to connect with others who speak their language, others who appreciate communion and appear from out of nowhere with a promise no more complicated than the chance to be together for a while. There are a lot like many of us. I rely on friends the way others rely on their lungs and social distancing feels to me a little like gasping for air. Technology offers us creative new ways to connect, but unscripted moments of actual human contact are my oxygen. I texted Mark the next day, really enjoyed getting out last night, just what I needed after a few rough months, so thanks. He responded, this virus may teach us there are more places than a bar to connect. Friendship, I think, is how many of us will survive. This is about the time during my speeches that someone in the wings hits me with a tranquilizer dart. So it's probably best that I shut up and field some questions from Laura and Dan who have kindly agreed to stand in on the audience's behalf. I'll leave you with this one thought from author Mark Friedman from his book, How to Live Forever. All too often, individuals are left to their own devices when it comes to finding a new sense of purpose in a post-retirement period that could be as long as the middle years in duration. Many feel like they're all alone in navigating the new terrain, practically and emotionally. Time is more precious. Questions of purpose and legacy are more prominent. That can sound depressing, but for many people, it's a powerful source of motivation for making the most of this period. As I've said, your vision of an ideal life may differ, but I urge you all to at least mull the idea of something, doing something totally different from what you've done in Acts 1 and 2. In my case, the decision to deliberately script my Act 3 has brought me to a place of endless adventure and discovery and re-energized me at a stage when most people are beginning to slow down. That's exactly what I hoped would happen. Whatever choices you make as you move forward, I hope they make you just as happy as mine have made me. That. And again, thank you for inviting me here today. I'll turn it now over to Laura and Dan. All right. Thank you so much, Marty. Um, I have, you know, I, I can't help but feel the, the immense courage that you had, you know, making this, uh, this big life change. And I, you know, the first question that I have is, wow, you know, it, it seems you had a really unique uh, set of circumstances, you know, with your sister and you had already formed this connection to Granby. And so it seems kind of hard to replicate. How would someone else do the same thing? <laughs> You know, I thought a lot about that um, as I was preparing this talk. Is it, you know, was my situation so unique that it could not be replicated or, or likely couldn't be replicated? But I don't think that's the case. Had we stayed in the Southern California housing market all these years, we bought our first house there in 1986. Had we stayed in that housing market, we would have our home paid off and we would have a ton of equity. Um, that equity is your ticket to anywhere you want to go and anything you want to do. Um, you know, you live in a place where starter homes cost more than a million dollars. Um, why not take that money and go see what it'll buy you somewhere else? Um, uh, we bought for a lot less than that in Granby, Colorado. Um, um, and we knew it was where we wanted to be. And I, I do think it's replicable. I do think other people could do exactly the same thing if they feel strongly enough that they have a need or a want to do it. All right. Yeah. So then you mentioned healthcare, the accessibility to healthcare, particularly in the third act, you know, when you need more maintenance and access to good healthcare. And then you have the, uh, the 
the need for veterinary uh, veterinary services really quick, um, <laughs> right? So, um, how do you navigate? How do you navigate that? And how are you set up? To get well, that, that was one of the concerns that my sister had at the time when she was building this house. She was married to a man who was both diabetic and he had childhood diabetic and bipolar. He needed significant medical attention. Um, and so one of her considerations in deciding where to build and where to buy um, was, is there a nearby medical facility that can, can offer at least, you know, um, immediate care? And there is. In Granby, there is a medical center for all of Grand County. Um, if it's a traumatic injury, if it's an injury way more complicated or a disease way more complicated than they can handle, there's a life flight into Denver. It's about a 20, 30 minute you know, a helicopter flight, um, but it is there, and I have used it. Uh, mountain bike accidents, things like that. I I ended it ended up there, and I'm satisfied that it's perfectly adequate. So, you know, that was that was an important consideration. Um, and I do think we're building from a strong foundation. Both Judy and I are both healthy. Uh, neither of us take medication. Um, uh, we go to our doctors, and and they ask us what medications we're on, and when we say none, they seem startled. Um, but we've been very fortunate health-wise, you know, knock wood. But for the moment, we are healthy and active and able to still do the things we want to do, although at a slower pace. Um, but we can still do everything we want to do. So those, those things are, um, they're legitimate considerations. And I realize how lucky we are that those are not major health concerns for us. Um, but I think most of us could manage something like this. Okay, and you you address the um, the connections with friends. I know it takes a lifetime to to forge these kind of relationships and community. And of course, we're we have a an unusual situation with COVID, and we're all finding alternate ways to connect. But that to sustain that, your choice to move out to such a remote area, um, how do you how did you deal with leaving friends? behind and starting again and forming new social contacts. You know, that may have been the hardest part of it all um, was, you know, was leaving behind, you know, I played on a soccer team, for example, I played on for almost 20 years. Um, I'm tight with those guys. I, I played ball with them for so many years. And um, to leave that, that community, that, that group of people, that group of friends, those were personal friends. We both had professional friends. Um, it was hard. It, you know, that took a lot of convincing on, on our, convincing ourselves um, that this was the right thing to do. On the other hand, the world has gotten very, very small. Um, look at what we're doing right now. Uh, it's, it's pretty amazing. Technology it can bring us all together anytime we want. After we're done here, I'm going to be having a Zoom family meeting with our two kids. Uh, we did it last week while my daughter was cooking dinner and watching her cook dinner in the apartment she shares with her fiance. Um, that was kind of startlingly intimate. Um, and so you don't lose it. Um, you just have to find different ways of indulging it. I was lucky in that I was able to come back every January. I was teaching a class at Chapman University uh, called Writing the Novel. It was a one-month workshop class during Chapman's inner term, and I was able to come back for a month every year for the first four years, three years that we were here, um, and reconnect, and, and, you know, spent that month having lunches with friends and dinners with friends, and, um, and that's, honestly, that's about the same amount of time that we get together, or the, 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 as often as we get together with friends when we lived in Southern California. So we just crammed it all into a month and life goes on. Okay, and then my last question. Um, you know, I'm, I'm an art and culture and loving extrovert. Um, I'm not sure I could be happy living in a town so small, so far from these great restaurants um, and the arts venues. And because we are gonna get, all get back together again and it, sports venues. Are there, are there trade-offs? I think absolutely, you know, and those are the things you have to weigh. I mean, I keep in mind 
we can be in downtown Denver in 90 minutes for my wife's birthday in February. Uh, there's a Monet exhibit at the Denver Art Museum. So we went in for that. That was a special occasion. We often, we don't make a habit of going into Denver, but we could if we wanted. Um, and so, you know, we go in mostly for airport trips, but we always hit Costco and we always hit the <laughs> Apple store if we need to hit the Apple store. And, you know, there is civilization just over the, the horizon. Um, but I do think some of the questions you do have to ask yourself, as you pointed out, is, is you know, what do you value most? For us, it was um, the natural world, you know, proximity to that, immersion in that. It was self-determination. Uh, and I, I don't mean that quite the way it sounds, but the idea of, of being able to build your life the way you want to build it um, was important to us. Uh, I think it's important to, to figure out how uncomfortable you are with the unknown, because there were a lot of unknowns when we moved here. Um, a, would we get along, you know, with, with all 24 seven together? Would we, um, you know, would we like the community? It's politically, it's very different than, than we are. This is a very red county and a very purple state, and we're very blue people. Would we fit in? It turns out, it doesn't really matter. If you throw yourself into the local community and you become part of that community and you show your willingness to, to be part of that community, nobody's ever asked me about my politics. Uh, we have great discussions, but nobody cares. It's, are you a good neighbor or not? Um, that was the human connection. That was the, the human scale living that we were looking for. And, and that was one of the unknowns that we really didn't understand when we first started. Um, it was really a non-issue. Um, and I think finally, if, if there are trade-offs, yes, there are not great restaurants in Grand County, Colorado. Um, I can name two that we consider worth the time and energy to go out to. The rest of the time we spend cooking. Uh, we have friends over, we, we spend time you know, that way. Um, were those trade-offs worth it? Absolutely. I'd still give my left arm for a good bowl of pho. Uh, and I, I've tried to talk every restaurateur in Granby into opening a pho restaurant um, to no avail, but that's been one of my missions and I will continue that as long as I live. I will tell you a quick story. There was a, a guy about 30 miles from us who opened a restaurant and started advertising pho. And so one day we drove down there to try it and see if it was any good. And guess where he had just moved from? Orange County, California. He had married a woman who lived 30 miles from here. Her family was here. He moved, moved up here and decided to start a restaurant. He decided to start serving pho. He was out of business within 10 months. Nobody up here knew what it was. Couldn't catch on. Yeah. Oh, well, it was our oh man. Well, I, I really, I really appreciate you, you talking to us today, Martin. And I, I really appreciate that. And I, I'm very grateful. Thank you so much. And thank you everybody for joining us today. Thank you. I'm grateful as well for the invitation and hello to everybody in Orange County.